I wanted to look at this again because there was something that kind of popped out at me that I hadn't really initially appreciated. Once again, this is from yesterday's video. This is the, the chart, the plot, sort of time series of the um, crew members, the, the navigation team of the USS Palau, which of course is a pseudonym, um, where you've got the plotter and the bearing recorder, or sorry, the bearing recorder and the plotter, I should say, in, in, in the order of the information coming in. The plotter is the most senior person. I believe there's five people on the team. There's like the compass guy. There's the two Pellerus people. So they're, they're on the side of the, of the ship looking at things through little telescopes that have uh, compasses attached to them. Or no, there's the depth guy. That's what the fifth guy is. And then there's the plotter or the bearing recorder who uh, is on the radio to the two guys on the outside of the ship. And then the guy who's actually drawing the the marks on the navigational chart is the sort of the leader. And so this concerns the, the two um, sort of most senior people who are trying to actually fix the position of the ship. Now the ship is careening into San Diego Harbor because it has had an accident and has lost power to the instruments and this is why these guys have to do this. And so in the book, Cognition in the Wild, Ed Hutchins is sort of an anthropologist watching these guys interact. And the reason why I go back to this demonstration or this sort of natural experiment that is incredibly fortuitous that, that Hutchins got this is because it demonstrates, so what, what you're looking at is you're looking at these sort of four epochs, so there's time along the horizontal axis and it is formulas, uh, uh, attempts, or, or whatever, strategies, or whatever you want to call it. So they have 13 different permutations of, of, of what they're trying to do. And then they proceed and they try to sort of try each one. And, and what's sort of interesting about it is you see them kind of converging on the solution, which happens down here. And so that is the 32nd try. So there's 13 permutations and 32 attempts before they finally sort out what the, the, what the uh, result is. Now, I'm probably, my head's probably in the way, but uh, the, so I sort of had gold and bronze or whatever you want to call it uh, for, the, for the rankings. And the slash sort of says, okay, well, one initiated it and then one, one completed it. Um, so that's just copying what was in the book um, and making it prettier. But what jumped out at me when I was reviewing this yesterday um, is something that I find to be kind of an overlooked aspect of just any kind of project planning where you have a set of, of processes or you have a set of, of tasks, the subtasks that you need to do, and you want to you, you want to put them in, or you have to put them in order somehow. And there is a sort of set of dependencies. There's a there's an order, and one order is objectively better than all of the others for some reason or other. It's either impossible to do without being in that order or maybe it's just a lot more efficient in that order and and so what is interesting about this particular thing is the order of a set so if you're going to put all of the elements of a set in a particular order it is factorial the, the sort of possible permutations, the possible configurations is, is the factorial of, of, the, of the set. And what I noticed yesterday is that the first seven of these are three, well, the first seven attempts uh, use three terms and then they remember that there was a fourth term that they had to include. But what sort of fascinating about it is that the factorial of three is six. And so they actually go through every kind of possible permutation and then some. The parentheses imply, and this again was just copied from the, the text, 
parentheses imply a uh, use of a calculator and the uh, square brackets imply like a spoken intermediate sum. And that's how to read that. But um, so, so they realized effectively that they, they were making a mistake for the first, you know, up until the end of this section uh, when, they, when they add the, the D term, which wasn't there before. And that has to do with like a, a compass delta because they had forgotten about it. But again, the problem is a very, what was so, so uh, highlights to me, what's so, super important about this is that the, they're trying to divide the labor of a particular task of calculating this really simple sort of elementary modulo arithmetic because they're just trying to aim a compass through 360 degrees kind of a thing. And, and they're just like, it's a simple thing to do by yourself, but when you're trying to split the, the process up and, they, and again they're doing it because the the bearing recorder is getting readings over the radio uh, and and he's trying to produce a sort of partial product that the plotter sitting at the desk it, it needs to just add another term to so when you see down here the relative bearing term is the one thing so this is spoken this is sort of c plus d plus v so the d is a constant and the v is also a constant the compass heading is what they get from the from the people uh, on the on the the wings of the bridge, and that's when they sort of finally circular uh, come. So like you can see that the the bearing recorder is is saying C plus D plus like calculating C plus D plus V to the plotter who adds R B to it, and that's how they kind of they kind of stabilize on the solution, and. Again, it is super simple what the problem is. It's incredibly well defined and you can see that they sort of exhaust, first of all, they exhaust the combinatorial space of the three term solution. Then they realize, oops, we were missing one all along, but they had some experience with this already which is why it's interesting that it very quickly converges after that. And you can also see they kind of backtrack um, these A, B, C, D, E, F, etc., are sort of attempts, they're like failed attempts. But you see them, you know, they're converging on a solution and they come down through this, set, uh, this order as they order these, these appear. Um, but they backtrack in multiple places. They backtrack here, here, and here, and they backtrack all the way here. They backtrack again to this position, uh, and then they backtrack again here and then they backtrack, so they're sort of, um, uh, they're again, they're kind of exhausting the space. They realize that the term is missing, the D term is missing, uh, and then they backtrack one more time. Uh, and again, when you're, there's two that show up, that's them correcting or uh, a mistake, the two that show up on the same vertical. And then again, they kind of backtrack one more time here until they realize what they need to do. So I guess the, the take home for me when I look at this problem space is that if it's this hard for something that is the most well-defined, easiest, most elementary, like most formal thing, uh, problem space, like what is, the, what is the implication for stuff that's way more complex? That is the take home of this, of this visualization. Anyway, I'm gonna finish my coffee.